Welcome to all of you and welcome to our two guests, Ofa Kassif, member of Knesset from Hadass, and Ratebe Alaidin, uh, active political uh, member of uh, FIDA, and uh, also uh, sort of taking part in some PLO activities. We can talk about this a little bit later. We will do it like this, the meeting. My name is Sus Nissen. Uh, I've arranged this meeting together with a whole group of nice people who are also in the room. I will not mention everyone because we are a group of 10 people and Transform International and the uh, Palestine uh, group under the Union Green, Red Green Alliance have been organizing this. Uh, and we have uh, support, been supported by a, a set of foundations who supported this event and this week of visits uh, to Malmö also and to Aarhus for our guest. We are very happy you are here. We have unfortunately too uh, little uh, exposure to uh, to our friends and comrades from uh, Palestine and Israel, and we are we are really looking forward to hearing from you um, from the ground, and to uh, you can for sure enlighten us on different aspects. Um, we will do it like this, that we'll start giving you each sort of 10 minutes uh, with uh, what is most important for you to talk about. We put some headlines that we would like you to come around, but it's a free speech also in the sense that you are also allowed to consider based on the developments in the region and what concerns you now, what you find most important to inform the rest of us about. And uh, they, but the headline for uh, for you, Ufa, was uh, sort of fascism and its development in Israel, uh, which is uh, a little bit sensitive for us to talk about. It's only allowed in weekend Weekendavisen, a big Danish newly newspaper, where it does where they do speak about it a little bit. But otherwise, it's a little bit we don't want, do not speak too much about it because it's it's a it's a paradigm shift for us to think of Israel in that sense. So we would like to hear a little bit about this. And you, Ratebe, have been uh, speaking to some of our friends about the uh, EU's responsibility where they were impressed of your uh, strong speech in this sense, so we would like you to, to maybe start around this, and then you certainly also can come around other, other uh, issues. And then uh, after that, I'll ask them a few questions, and then we'll get the answers, and then we'll give the floor free for any kind of questions that are on your mind. And then uh, let's just make the best out of it, out of the meeting. And I promise not to speak too much, <laughs> even though I often have a lot on my mind. But I'll start giving the word to you actually, Matipe, because uh, there's also this reality that we hear the least from Palestinians actually in Denmark. So we need to hear more from uh, Palestinians uh, coming out from Palestine. Good evening. Actually, I will start with um, a, something that I read in now before I enter this hall. It's about um, a decision or discussion uh, in the Israeli government uh, about um, the level of reaction or the way of reaction that they must uh, take against the criminal behavior of ICC. So you can see that we are facing a system. It's not a, a country, it's a system uh, that consider everyone as um, a terrorist, um, that they are crime, crime criminals, and the only victim in this world is this system, which called itself the state of Israel. This is state, it's above everything we know about the international law, about the agreements that we have, uh, all the clarifications and everything that we know as international law or behavior, or the behavior or the relation that uh, put maybe borders between the countries and the relation between them. This system <coughs> is above all of these things. And they have the right to judge everyone and to put their own roots in this, this world. Including what is happening now in the West Bank and Gaza. Everyone is witnessing genocide, ecocide, annexing land, illegal annexing for the land, transfer, uh, 
punishment for people for nothing, arresting children. Uh, I don't know. They have like hostages, 7,000 hostages, Palestinian hostages in the Israeli jails. They are not prisoners. Because the prisoners must have like a train, a case, something that can consider as a crime to be a prisoner. At least to be a fighter. But we, what we witnessed in the last year, it's like taking people without any reason and put them in jail. Because maybe, maybe they will be a danger in this system in the future, including children. We have 700 child under the age of 14 arrested in East Jerusalem. No one is mentioning that. No one is mentioning that. Because it seems that the Palestinian people is something out of the humanitarian system and values that this world has. It's allowed to kill us. Come and kill us. You will feel, feel free from guilt because maybe you are guilty of a genocide that happened eight years ago against the Jewish, and you must get revenge from this guilt that you have by killing us. Maybe this is the equation now. We have 10 million refugees all around the world seeking the right of returning back to their lands. They are not talking about killing people, not talking about occupying another land, just their right to belong to a home, for me, to have a state, a citizenship, as well as you are all, you have a citizenship, I'm stateless, I'm, I'm considered from nowhere, maybe I come from another planet, I don't know, but I didn't have the right as well as all of you, and 400, uh, four, 400,000 people in East Jerusalem have the same case of mine. We are stateless because we are waiting since 35 years for the final solution that you, as European, suggested in Oslo Agreement. Abandoned. We are abandoned case since 35 years and you took no action as European to solve this abandoned issue. Our demand is very, very clear and simple. We want to live in a free state, independent state. We ask for a historical Palestine, one state, for two nations. And you say that this is terrorist because we are threatened the existence of the Jewish in their state. So we accept to be under what we call, you call it, the international legacy. And we accept all the UN <coughs> resolutions. And we accept the suggestion that you gave to us as a solution by having two states to accept all of these legacy, international law, and whatever. And we accept it as Palestinian. And now we are fighting to, to ask you to take an action <laughs> to survive this solution that you are proposing to us as a justice for the Palestinian case. We want to live on, on one third of our historical land. It's not too much. We deserve it because we exist since, since 10,000 years ago. We have heritage, we have educated people, we have intelligent people, we deserve to live and to share this planet with you as a human. It's not too late to talk about a state. I don't know if it's one state, two state, whatever, but we deserve to exist. And what is happening now in this year that everyone agree on killing us. They use that they are fighting Hamas. And it's a funny fact. 
Because where is Hamas? Where is Hamas in 17,000 children that they killed? Where is Hamas when they destroyed the hospitals? Where is Hamas when they are killing people, people from starvation? Where is Hamas in this equation? Where is Hamas in Jenin, not in Gaza? Where is Hamas in Jerusalem? I don't know if there is any active person of Hamas in Jerusalem, but I can tell you that 360 houses were, were demolished in East Jerusalem, and no one mentioned that. There's a whole village called Silwan is going to be demolished in the next year or the next maybe week or very soon, and no one is mentioning <clears throat> that. No one mentioning the transfer of the people in the West Bank and Gaza. No one is judging Smotrich and Ben Veer about this kind of speeches that we can't consider it as a humanitarian uh, issue. It's a bullshit. I can't say that there's anyone in this, in this world can use this much of hate speech as much as those people. When Smotrich go and come and say in public that we have as Palestinians just the three choices to be transferred, to be killed, and the rest of us who survive from killing, they must be servants for the, the Jewish nation. Because we are not a human in his eyes and his mind. We are less than human beings. And no one took an action of it. But everyone took an action when they feel that one of the Palestinian parties, I'm not talking about Hamas, I'm talking about the left parties in Palestine, the communist parties, uh, such as us, that they hold the same values and everyone now judging them because they, are, they have not the right of self-defense. They want us, when the, when the uh, time comes, and pump our houses to throw them with flowers, maybe, or to stand and die in peace. We have no right of self-defense, but Israel has the right of self-defense by killing more than 100,000 people in Gaza, destroying all the refugee camps in the West Bank in a daily pace. We, we wake up with one, two, or more people are killed with these attacks. Tens of people arrested in the West Bank. There's no Hamas in the West Bank. This attack, it's not about Hamas. It's about ending the exist of the Palestinian people. And this is not the first one they tried to kill us and end our existence. In, 1990, in 1948, the first Nakba. In 1956, they tried to kill all the people who were, who who become refugees in Gaza Strip. In 1982, they attacked the refugee camps in Lebanon, the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, trying to kill them. Five wars in Gaza Strip. This is the fifth one. This is not the first one. And maybe you have a very small memory or short memory, and you don't remember that in 2014, Netanyahu was the Prime Minister of Israel, and he made the same attack against Gaza people for 50 days. And what stopped him? Not the, the European Union. Of course, because he has the right of killing us, in your opinion. It's a self-defense. And it wasn't the 7th of October and Hamas attack in that time, 10 years ago. It was just his gravity of killing Palestinian people. He didn't agree on the step of getting out of Gaza in 2005. So he want to re-occupy Gaza Strip by force, by killing people. You can't see the whole story from that? It's not the 7th of October. It's not Hamas that it exists 35 years ago and become strong by the support of Israel.
They got money through Israel every month. Hundreds of thousands of dollars come in, in, in bags from airport, Ben Gurion airport to Gaza Strip with the supervision of the Israeli government to Hamas to strengthen them and to use them as an excuse for killing the Palestinian people. It's not about Hamas. And it's not about the 7th of October. It's about a very long-term struggle for Palestinian people to get their right in existence and having their independent state. Thank you. I was checking if it goes beyond the red line. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, I will give the word directed to Omer and then we can have a few questions. Good evening. Thank you for having us here with you. It's honored. Uh, I would like to begin more or less with a, a, where uh, Ratiba uh, finished. But, you know, a bit before, I would like to begin with something that maybe sound personal, but it's very political and not personal. I'm a member of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, with the Communist Party, with Hadash, which is the Democratic Front for Peace and Equality, based on the Communist Party. And just last week, I've been suspended yep. by the Knesset for six months. Why was I suspended for six months? Because mainly there are few reasons but all of them are around the same thing because i insisted to call to the ongoing atrocities in gaza genocide so in israel it's now when i get back to it if time allows it's not only that now israel for more than a year carries out a genocide in gaza but it is also forbidden to mention it. So if one hand of the Israeli government and, and its allies, if one hand destroys and kills in Gaza, the other hand is put over the mouths of those who want to cry out about those crimes. So in Gaza, more than a year, it is a genocide that has been going on. We must call reality in the right name. Not sugar coated it in different terms to make it less ugly, because it is ugly. And you must say it. There is a genocide. Up till now, we know about more than 50,000 Palestinians who were killed, and the death toll is probably much, much higher. There are still many bodies under the rubble. Almost 20,000 children are among those who were killed. No hospitals left. No churches and mosques are left. No schools. Everything is destroyed. In purpose, intentionally, systematically, on a daily basis, still goes on. This is a genocide. And by the way, experts of all over the world, experts, I mean historians and researchers in the, in the academia and elsewhere, whose expertise is genocide, many of them sent an organized letter together months ago and published it saying that it was a genocide. And under the small screen of the genocide that goes on in Gaza, there's an ethnic cleansing goes on in the West Bank. More than 20 Palestinian communities perished in the West Bank in the last year, mainly of shepherds because armed settlers are on a daily basis, every day and especially every night, invade those peaceful 
I've been there a lot of times. I have friends there. Invade those communities in the West Bank to assault them, to bother them, to make their lives as miserable as possible. Everything, of course, under the auspices of the occupation forces and with their support and defense. And same as Latiba said in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, occupied East Jerusalem, there are houses and neighborhoods that are going to be totally destroyed. By the way, in order to give the land, all the houses, if they are not destroyed, but evacuated, as it were, to give it away, them away to Jewish settlers. And even within Israel proper, no less than 14 villages in the Negev, the south of Israel, 14 villages are about to be totally wiped out of earth. Some of them already de destroyed. Like Umel Khiran. Last week, Umel Khiran was totally demolished. And again, they are demolished in order to build Jewish towns and villages. And this is within Israel. It's not against the Palestinians who live under a military occupation rule, but those who are actually citizens in Israel. And they too are under a vicious and continuous attack by this government specifically, but it didn't begin with them. Now, the October 7, the massacre committed by Hamas was a war crime. It was a war crime, and it was a crime against humanity. There is no legitimacy to the carnage that Hamas committed on October 7th. Not even the crimes of the occupation that began many years before. The dispossession, the Nakba you mentioned. <clears throat> but once we accept that, we have to accept too that nothing can justify the genocide Israel carries out. Not even the massacre committed by Hamas. And the vast majority of the victims in Gaza are innocent civilians. More than 70 percent. Doctors who were there sent a letter to Biden. And I say something about Biden in a second, or a couple of minutes if I have. Those doctors sent two or three months ago a letter, those doctors who were in Gaza, and wrote to Biden that they personally saw little children, little children, as six years old or eight years old, shot by snipers, one bullet directly to their head or chest. If this is not genocide, please tell me what genocide is. And within Israel, alongside the genocide, the atrocities, the crimes against the Palestinian people, and by the way, also against the Lebanese, 40 villages in South Lebanon do not exist anymore. 40. But within Israel, there's a process of fascism. Israel, that was never a democracy, because there is no democracy without equality. Without equality. Israel was established and based throughout the years on Jewish supremacy. So it was never really a democracy. I call it ethnocracy. But now Israel is turning a, a, into a full-fledged fascist regime. There is a political persecution within Israel of anyone who raises an alternative voice to the government to its genocidal policies. Not only by the government, but by the majority of the uh, parliamentary opposition. That's the reason I've been suspended. And I'm privileged because I have immunity at the, at, at the moment. But the common people, as it were, in Israel, mainly Palestinian citizens, 21% of the Israeli citizenry are Palestinians. 
but not only Palestinian citizens, even Jewish citizens, are, who raise a voice against the genocide, against the government, are persecuted, people are arrested for posts and tweets, they are fired from their workplaces, they are suspended from their studies at university or colleges, because they dare say that there is a genocide and there are crimes against the Palestinian people in Gaza because they express sympathy for the people in, in Gaza, because they oppose the ongoing crimes. There's more than 100, at least of more than 100 bills and laws that are going to abolish totally any shred of a even pretension of democracy in Israel. We, the list of Hadash, we, Hadash, as I said before, that is based on the Communist Party, is a Jewish-Palestinian, the only Jewish-Palestinian political parliamentarian partnership. We are a Palestinian-Jewish party and movement. Next week or the week after, it's already in process, the Knesset is going to pass a law that will bar us from participating in the elections. And not only Hadash, but other Arab, other Arab parties are going to be barred altogether. The only democracy in the Middle East, of course, with the most moral army in the, in the world as well. <laughs> and if I had the time, I could give you many examples of those bills, as well as the persecution I mentioned. I want to say two things before I conclude. One minute, okay. <laughs> First of all, I want to strengthen what Ratiba said uh, 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 before. The ongoing genocide and the atrocities in the West Bank and elsewhere, and the persecution within Israel under the guise of fighting terrorism, of course, those have nothing to do with the security of Israel. Nothing. This is an excuse. They cling to the massacre of October 7th, and to the threat of terrorism as an excuse to pursue something they planned to do before. And if I have the time, I can specify the specific plan that was formulated already in 2017. This is one thing. And the last thing that I want, it's very important for me to say, because I know that in, the, in Denmark, like in many other societies, there are debates in regard to Israel, in regard to the ongoing uh, uh, crimes and genocide I mentioned. I want to conclude with one if, uh, uh, even emotional thing. <laughs> Denmark in the legacy, or let me begin in uh, another way. The family, the entire family of my grandparents on my mother's side were murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust. Nobody survived, but my grandparents, because they left Poland before the occupation, the Nazi occupation. Denmark is an historic hero. The Danish society is an historic hero for us, for Jews, for uh, those who associated the families who are victims or survivors of the Holocaust, because we all know that exactly 81 years ago, October 1943, more than 7,000 Jews were saved by the Danish people by sending them to Sweden. If the Danish government does not respect, for instance, the decision by ICC to arrest uh, Netanyahu and Gallant if they come here, I, I wish you, they not, because I don't want you to be hurt. Uh, so it's better if you don't have to host them. But anyway, if, or I want to say, if the government of Denmark doesn't respect the decision of the ICCs, if the government of Denmark doesn't adopt a policy that very explicitly and loudly calls for stopping the genocide 
it will undermine the legacy of 1943. And I urge you to put a pressure on your government and tell it, the, tell it, the government, tell it. Like you saved the Jews 81 years ago, save the Palestinians now, before it's too late. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We already know that they uh, they might look into whether the Vienna Convention on uh, Impunity for Diplomats is higher than the ICC. All these discussions are already going on, and many years ago, the former chief of Mossad was in Denmark. We tried to get him arrested for torture. And here, for sure, the Vienna Convention was above the Torture Convention. So we'll have all these kind of funny discussions when it, when it or if it should happen. Okay, I want to. Uh, I, I think since we have you here now, and we seldom hear about Palestinian politics, but there's a lot of discussion in media about Palestinian political parties. I would actually like you to ask you a little bit about the. The, the talks about the unity and the challenges of uh, many Danes would say that oh, it's, it's a little bit too bad that there's not a, a, a very unified, strong Palestinian resistance movement and uh, why don't you have a Mandela or Gandhi or all these kind of things. <laughs> this is typical Danish questions. Uh, so, but my question can be a little bit more sophisticated and a little bit giving us an update on what has been the obstacles for for making unity? Why is unity important? Is it important at all? And what is the stakes currently uh, with regards to this issue? And the last thing I heard was something in China, but uh, I don't know exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or Turkey? I don't know. Yes. Uh, okay. okay um, everyone using the Palestinian splash, internal splash, um, as an excuse. We are unified against occupation. Every Palestinian, if he's with the PLO, uh, against the PLO, with the Palestinian Authority, against the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, Fatah, whatever, we are all united in one demand to be set free from occupation and our very, very clear demand that no one, whatever ideologic thoughts he has or background he has, can't ignore it. That we want to be free, we want independent state, the return of the refugee. We are united in this as Palestinians. We have some internal problems, and I think that everywhere in the world there is uh, many uh, thoughts and ideologic uh, background and way of resistance, but it's not an excuse to to use it not to give the Palestinian their rights and their demands. Yeah. It's internal issue. And yes, I can tell you about the process that we are going uh, through, um, you, and the interest of many countries and powerful. Uh, pulls in the Middle East that try to put force on the Palestinian uh, parties so they are not maybe united. And maybe it's very healthy to be not united hmm. in Palestine because we can try different methods. Then now, none of these methods succeeded to give us an independent state or to get, uh, to get, to get us uh, free from occupation. But we have the right to try all the methods that it's allowed it. And one of these methods is to resist by fighting, to resist by uh, <coughs> diplomatic ways, to resist by just existing in our land and refuse to be transferred, to keep our heritage, and all of these things. We have a lot of methods to use, and we are allowed to use it as well as other peoples, and it's a Palestinian internal issue and right to have these differences of thoughts uh, for the people. And yes, China maybe and other countries, Egypt and Russia and a lot of other countries, try to make to give a hand. 
for the Palestinian to look like they, they are united so they can uh, maybe uh, pass this excuse that everyone is, is using. What it's about before Hamas exists? Hamas exists uh, in which year? 87. 1987, let's say, maybe a little bit before that, uh, informally, but the occupation is many years before that. Okay? The Palestinian case is eight decades of conflicts and resistance, and the right of, we are asking for the right of independence. The PLO established years before Hamas not just before the splash between Fatah and Hamas, years before Hamas become in the Palestinian street. Hamas is something new mm -hmm. on the Palestinian culture, but it's not an excuse. And before Hamas, no one took an action to give us independence as Palestinian and agree on our rights as Palestinian. So it's an excuse that you want to know it. But if you have some, uh, yani, um, uh, gracious to, to know um, about what is happening, uh, yes, we achieved a very good agreement uh, in Egypt uh, last month, uh, and we are working on having like a plan for the next day after this genocide and this war or this attack uh, uh, on Gaza stops, but uh, it seems endless. Uh, we need an action to stop uh, these attacks uh, on the civilians, Palestinians, on Gaza before we are talking about conciliation or something like that. Because if we wait for another 400 year, uh, days, now we are 420 days uh, of attack against Gaza, maybe there will be no Palestinian left in Gaza or no Hamas left to make conciliation or anything else. So the first demand will be uh, ceasefire and um, starting to recognize our right as Palestinian. And then we can manage our internal house in our way. Thank you. Good. You're saying something that uh, a good old friend of ours, uh, who was editor of the a Danish magazine called Palestina Orientering, Søren Højmark, said for many years, he said, uh, remember, Søs, that everybody wants the Palestinians to behave as nice school children, and then they will have their right. Everybody, sorry, it's, Palestinian needs a different level to be human, to have human rights and to be allowed to live. They need to behave all the way to the good school, otherwise they will not have rights. And that's, uh, that's also what you summarized here. Um, one question to to you, sort of. Uh, we talk. You talked a little bit about this uh, fascist development. Could you maybe say that? Uh, so what what do you want us to sort of uh, to to to? Do we need a different lens when we look at Israel? What should we be aware of? What should we speak more of? What should we? What kind of taboos should we break when we talk about Israel in the in a Danish debate? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I. There are so many, but uh, perhaps I use uh, I give you you know a few examples of what's going on within Israel to to show that uh, how dangerous is this escalation or deterioration within Israel towards a real fascist regime. So I give you. Uh, I begin with two examples. Uh, a young teacher from the north of Israel, Palestinian, uh, from a village, from a city, from a town, Palestinian town, not very far from the city of Haifa. For those who more perhaps know, uh, she posted last year herself on TikTok dancing video when she was dancing, and. One year later, TikTok <coughs> reloaded the video automatically mm. and put, <coughs> published the date. Mm. Apparently, that's what uh, TikTok does. I don't know, I really don't follow TikToks, but that's what I understand. The date was 7th of October. Mm. 
the <coughs> minister, the minister of a, a so-called national security, who is one of the worst fascists and racists that there are, and there are many, gave a direct order, which is, by the way, against the Israeli law itself, to the police to arrest her for that because she celebrated the massacre. She was immediately arrested from her home, one, one uh, parent family, in front of her uh, little girl. She was taken, uh, her, uh, you know, blindfolded, her feet and head and uh, uh, arms, hands, sorry, were cuffed. She was taken to the police station. She was humiliated there. Police men were shouting at her, come on, dance for us, and things like that. She was spent a few days there before they had to bring her in front of a judge who immediately released her. And uh, she's, she's a teacher. She's supposed to get back to her job because there was nothing there. <laughs> So, and, and I met her, I, I went to visit her after she was released and she told me the, the whole story, including things that were not published, like, for instance, the humiliation she went through. Another example is of a Jewish teacher, who also I know, we, we are associates politically, 40 years uh, he's been teaching in the high school. He, <coughs> last year, a little while after the massacre of October 7, he posted names, photos, and ages of children who were killed by Israel in Gaza. Because nobody in Israel knows, mm. from the media or anywhere, anyway else, about the identity of those Palestinians. Palestinians, as Ratiba said, said, are numbers in Israel. They have no humanity. Mm. So he posted them in order to say and to show people they are human beings we are dealing with not numbers. Mm. He was immediately fired from the school when he was teach where he was teaching. <laughs> the mayor of the city uh, ordered that he will not be able to teach anywhere else in that city. The minister of education revoked his teaching license. And he was arrested, accused in treason, he was, he was arrested, accused in treason and not in incitement. Or we, obviously, he was, not, he was not inciting either, but in order to uh, arrest someone uh, and charge <coughs> someone in incitement, there must be a confirmation of the Attorney General. In order to avoid the confirmation of Attorney General, mm -hmm. the police decided to accuse him in treason because that doesn't necessitate the confirmation of the Attorney General. So he was confined into a cell, a special cell for security risks, without the ability to change clothes, to have books or nothing, in total isolation, 23 hours a day in the, in, inside the cell, one hour, only one hour outside to walk alone, because it's a risk, it's danger. <laughs> For four days, after four days, when the police had to bring him in front of a judge, according to the law, at least for now, the judge immediately said, this was unlawful, his arrest was unlawful. He released him, and, and my friend, my this teacher, has been suing now the police, the state, the, uh, the city council, and everything. Mm -hmm. He already won part of those cases, part are still on. Those are two examples of what's going on in Israel. There are thousands of cases like this. And this is, the, if you like, the reflection of the genocide. If one side is the genocide and the crimes against the Palestinian people, as I said before, in other words, so the other side is to persecute and silence those who raise a voice against those crimes. Now, I think that one of the things that people in general, in all the world, and especially people who live in societies and states that are considered democratic, is to talk, is to cry out loud that supporting the government of Israel is against the Israeli people. It's not only against the Palestinians. Support, you want to support the Israelis? 
like some, like some states say, you must be against the government of Israel. Both because of the crimes it commits against the Palestinians, but also because of the crimes it commits and the danger it poses for the Israelis themselves. I think this is something that everybody should know because the lies of the media in Israel and many other places, the propaganda, they just, everybody just, you know, not everybody, but the so-called mainstream media and politicians, etc., don't tell the truth and actually hide the truth and persecute those who say it. And I finish with one sentence or quotation. George Orwell, the one who wrote 1984, said that the more society clings to lies, the more it will persecute those who are telling the truth. This is exactly the situation in Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say it's also a little bit starting in Denmark. We have we yeah. have a demonstration today of 200 uh, young people in uh, Gamelto in solidarity of some of the right. young people who are being charged, uh, maybe not charged, I don't remember, sikdu for for different things, uh, and uh, it's it's starting with different cases also on uh, that is the sort of on freedom of expression in Denmark. Um, I'll open up now for different questions, uh, and you'll get the microphone from your yeah. side. Yeah. <coughs> we only have one mic, so we'll find out. Sorry, I'm just going to get a big call. Yes. So Thomas first, or so he'll be um, yeah, my name is Thomas. Um, so my question is, at least, I mean, uh, I'd say that you said a little bit about Palestinians has the situation has been ignored, but I mean, I think there's been quite a few, few statements by different UN institutions, the International Court of Justice, the International Court, the Criminal Court. I mean, different human of different UN institutions has assessed the situation, I think, um, in very uh, precise ways. Um, and also there's many statements of the UN General Assembly where you have the lack is kind of the Security Council and kind of the follow-up of uh, action by, uh, especially, you can say, in our, in my opinion, if the United States and European Union kind of really took the issue of um, justice of uh, international law serious, then natural thing was to, be, to impose sanctions on Israel to force Israel to change their attitude. So my question is actually for both of you, if we imagine that United States government and, uh, and uh, the European governments were doing what we are proposing to impose sanctions on Israel, how would the effect be? I, I remember I was one who said, oh, if that happened, the far right, radical right in Israel would be stronger, so that's a bad idea. But I would, would uh, like to hear what you think. Uh, Can I answer it in a long way or in a short way? <laughs> because I have a long story about that. It's like, let's put it in the opposite way, okay? If the states or the countries, including the United States, didn't respect the international law and the ICC decision and the UN resolution, the whole international law and community will collapse. Absolutely. Why? Because if you allowed Israel to annex the West Bank, the Lebanon, the south of Lebanon, as well as it annexed the, the Syrian uh, Gulen, 
and mm -hmm. the east of Jerusalem, yeah. then you must allow Russia to annex part of Ukraine, or maybe a little bit more, because yeah, it, if you get it like in percentage, it can get more. Mm -hmm. And you must allow Turkey to annex lands from Cyprus, mm -hmm. from Greek, and other lands that you want to, it want to uh, annex it. And no one must take any action against that. And we will start talking about <coughs> Germany that want to be a little bit annexing lands from here on there, maybe occupying Denmark as well, some lands of Denmark, again, they can. Mm -hmm. And maybe we are talking about re- uh, um, uh, 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 um, reforming. reforming, yeah, reforming the whole world and countries and borders. If you want and you want, will have that, and then you will allow Israel to be uh, above the international law. Mm. If you allowed Netanyahu to land here in Denmark without arresting him, you must allow for more and more killing and using for weapons against innocent people without taking an action, okay? We are witnessing uh, a point of a new world. We can see the, the, the signs of multipolar world that it's forming now, but it can be a multipolar world that can bring to us peace, security, and stability for everyone, or it can be a third war, or something worse than that, that will destroy the humanity all around the world. Now it's, about, now it's not about just Israel and Palestine. It's about the system that its rules now. You can keep the system, or go for a better system, or to have a collapse? And this is my answer. Okay, maybe the question was also to Ufa, actually, uh, because it's a typical uh, argument in the Danish debate, or it has been for 30 years, no, and it has been used, the EU has actually pressured the PA not to continue on the legal way uh, to save the peace process and to calm the Israelis and all these kind of arguments, we've heard that for a long time. <coughs> uh, look, unfortunately, and it is unfortunate, the, most of the global institutions are quite hypocritical. If they weren't the first ones to be uh, tried and put in prison, uh, were probably most of the presidents of the United States since 1945. <laughs> no, I guess that Kissinger probably had to be the first one to be imprisoned for life. But so we know that there is hypocrisy and this hypocrisy is exactly the opposite of what the government of Israel has been claiming. The government of Israel and shamefully, apart from us, all the opposition too in Israel, we are the only ones who actually publicly we stated, we published a statement in support of the ICC's uh, uh, rule to uh, uh, issue those arrest warrants against Gallant and Netanyahu. I must say too little and too late, but better than nothing. So, but those others, the government and the others in the coalition and the public, not the all public of course, but great segments of the public, argue, of course, anti-Semitism and the uh, the world is hypocritical against Israel. I totally agree that the world, generally speaking, is hypocritical because it's too much in favor of Israel. Exactly the opposite of what the government of Israel says. If it wasn't, those warrants were issued ages ago. Yeah. If they weren't, the occupation would have stopped ages ago. The genocide could not pursue And because of that, I mentioned before my urge to you, and I mentioned what Denmark did 
81 years ago. Because, you know, the international law and institutions like the United Nations itself, and also to some extent, the both courts in The Hague were a consequence of the Holocaust. And the irony, the tragic irony, is that the state that pretends to represent the main victims of the Holocaust, and I emphasize the word pretend, mm. is the one that wants to undermine now more than anyone else the very same institu institutions. Mm. This is a sheer and clear indication to hypocrisy. Now I totally embrace what Rativa said. If there is no international law and enforcement, uh, and not just enforcement, impartial enforcement of international law, if there's nothing like those two, that's the end of all of us. There's no future because then we are going to live in so-called according to the laws of jungle. Mm. Yeah. The whole idea of those institutions, main idea was to prevent from the laws of jungle to rule. And the behavior of the international community, generally speaking, and especially of the United States and Biden's administration, in the last year, do not only make them complicit in the genocide of the against the Palestinians, but also complicit in the destruction of the world order, not order of uh, power, etc., order uh, uh, that, uh, that has laws. Mm. And uh, the, 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 the fate of the Palestinians to a great extent now is a fate <coughs> of humanity. Mm. And that should guide us. Thank you. So, summing up, impunity is uh, what is also leading this to become worse and worse because no action has been taken earlier on. Um, we have two more questions and we have many more, but Helen and then you, I think we take a couple of questions or three and then you will be answered. Oh, so you have to remind me if I forget. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> try to. <laughs> So actually what you're saying is that uh, with your example of Kissinger and the American uh, presidents that uh, the international system is really exposing itself as it has been for many, many years. Uh, it's not impartial, it was never impartial uh, because it was only valid for people who lived in uh, developing countries with uh, dictatorships and so on, but never for democracies and so-called democracies. So that's what you see. It's broken already. So, apart from that, my question is to Vatibi. I would love to hear something about what's going on on the ground. I know a lot about, uh, of course, Gaza and also the demolishing in, in East Jerusalem, and, uh, the attacks on the West Bank and so on. Uh, but people in general, a lot of people are living with this but are not personally being uh, attacked. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm not, I don't know, I'm asking. So, so I'm asking, are people um, uh, afraid? Are they, what are they talking about? Are they organizing? Are they leaving? Are they, what's going on among people you know, people um, in different places? Can they work? Can they, um, can they study somewhere? Um, so sort of, sort of a general impression of how this affects uh, all parts of the Palestinian people. And I'm asking because I don't know, because I yeah, yeah. don't read much about it. I read about all the atrocities, but I, I, I don't see much about so that part of the, the story. Thank you. Two questions. It's well known that all of the former colonial powers in the West always have been uh, supporting the settler colony. But during some years now, uh, Israel has uh, been the attention of the extreme right in the whole world 
they are supporting Israel today. Uh, most clearly, for instance, uh, President Milei uh, from Argentina. What, how are you considering this situation in Israel? Are there any discussions of that? That's the one question. The other questions, uh, we know very well of uh, the influence of Israel in the United States, uh, but we can see that uh, the uh, influence of Israel in Europe has also been still larger. Could you uh, elaborate a little on how Israel is intervening in the European countries, please? Questions to remember, very different, but let's take a few more questions and then, uh, yeah. Elna was first, I think. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations. Briefly, uh, I, I hear you speak almost like you still believe in international law. I don't think it has served the, the Palestinian cause very much. I'm a lawyer myself, so I can say it. Uh, so, so do you think, still believe in international law and all these court cases? Or what do you think is the best strategy for you to achieve this final goal of a free state? Is the boycott campaign? Is it, what is it? How do you, what is your strategy from now on? And then one specific question to you, because you're in the Knesset when they decided uh, on UNMA. Uh, and, and again, a bit like you, we, if you could shed some light on, on that discussion. Uh, we know the result, but, but how did it come about? Uh, I heard there was not a lot of resistance against it. What was the discussion and, and how will the future look like in Gaza and the West Bank without UNMA? Uh, thank you. Måske skal vi lige tage nogle svar. Jeg already forgot. Yeah, I can repeat. It was what's going on in daily life. It was something about sort of the far right wing alliance with with Israel and it, the lobby activity, actually Israel's influence. And then it was uh, if we still believe in international law or what else could be strategies and. Um, and the precise question on UNRWA. I'll let you start. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's very hard to live under occupation. And I'm living uh, in East Jerusalem under the occupation. Mm. All what is surrounded uh, around me is just the Israeli law. And I will start from my family. I am a mother of three uh, young ladies. The middle one. Uh, she entered the hospital twice because some uh, she's a singer in a band called uh, the, the Daughters of Jerusalem. And, and she's uh, uh, as well in the orchestra, the young orchestra for Palestine. Mm. And they arrested some of her friends in the orchestra. Mm. And they treat them very badly. She's 15 years, she was 15 years old. And that's just because they participated in a festival, in, in, in a tour uh, at the festivals uh, in many countries, singing for Gaza and for Jerusalem and for Palestine. She became very afraid because she, she, every night she wake up with this fear that they will attack our house and got her to jail and bite her as well as her friends and colleagues just because she's a singer. So this year I decided to send her to the United States to uh, continue her um, uh, study school. She, she's uh, in the secondary school uh, because she can't handle the situation anymore. My eldest daughter, she study filmmaking uh, in a university in the west, uh, in the east uh, Jerusalem. It's an Israeli institute. It's not an Israeli institute. It's an international institute. But but now the power is for the Israeli. They kick her out of the school not because she's not creative enough as a filmmaker but because she's the only Palestinian in the class and they want to make the, dis dis the uh, discussions inside the, the lessons in Hebrew and she can't speak Hebrew very well. 
although the curriculum is in English and the films will be made in the 14 formal languages in the United States and she has a diploma in the French and she speaks English, English as a uh, tongue language as well as Arabic and these are three languages that it's used in the UN as mm -hmm. formal languages mm -hmm. and no films is really <coughs> made in, in Hebrew but just because they but just because she's Palestinian. We as Palestinian in East Jerusalem, we didn't have any rights as civilians in Israel. We just pay taxes, we work for them. I have a, a civil engineer company. Uh, we, we make a lot of services in this state, but we have no right at all. It's not easy to go for, that, for a doctor to have a check and you can't communicate with this doctor because he is speaking a different language. And to reach for a specialist, you must go to the other side of the city, which is really very hard to reach in public transportation for us as Palestinian women. I always hold this. It's not the kufiya that you know as a solidarity of Palestine. It's the sorrow of the Palestinian women. And this is the sewing that we have 10,000 years ago as Canaanians and Palestinians. And it's just remind me that we are strong enough as women to face all of these things. But still, we have a black picture all around us. It's not easy to live in a state that has 720 checkpoints. So you didn't have the freedom of getting from one point to another. I try to explain to my daughters my experience as a child and memories as a child in Gaza Strip, but they didn't believe me that I can reach Gaza because it seems that there is something in the Netherlands for them because they didn't imagine where is the way from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's not too far in the map, but it's impossible for us to reach it. Many people in the West Bank, they didn't see Jerusalem once in their life. They just loved Jerusalem and they put it in their hearts, but they didn't see it never ever, and they didn't dream even in the way how they can reach to this city that they hold in, in, in them. Many women get, get delivered, they deliver and get their babies on the checkpoints waiting for a soldier that he is like 18 or 19 years old to give them permission to go for the clinic or for the hospital. Many of people are not allowed it to harvest their olives trees mm -hmm. and it's the main resources of living in Palestine and a lot of agricultural lands has been taken. It's really very hard for people to live under occupation having no rights of, maybe now we are fighting as a feminist for the right of women to, uh, to get uh, um, uh, pregnant or, or not or whatever, and sexual issues and whatever. But in Palestine, we didn't have the right to choose if we want to keep this pregnancy or not, if we can have a healthy baby or not, if we have the right to, to get married from the one that we love or not. Because in my case, my mother and father got married for 17 years and the Israeli law didn't allow them to make like a paper that says that these two are married and they have children because my mother is from the West Bank and my father from Jerusalem. And I have no ID card till I got 16 years old. So it's, it's not easy to live under occupation. It's not easy to live under a laws that make you in the third or fourth level of citizen if you have a right of to be a citizen. It's not easy to, to, to feel that you are not even choose, can choose uh, when you will visit the doctor and if the Mbali clinic can enter the village today or not. And if you are allowed to, uh, to work in your land or not. For most of the women, the, the most, uh, the main resources 
of living for them, it's from the agriculture. But now we have no land for agriculture because the settlement is, going, is growing more and more in our lands. Mm. This is what it means to live under occupation for more than eight decades. It's more than just what we witnessed in, in, in the attacks, the military attacks. It's about the daily life that we live and suffer from it. I know a woman in Sheikh Jarrah that she can't take a shower with, uh, uh, um, without having clothes. She dressed, she, she got a shower while she dressing all her clothes. Why? Because she has suspicions that the settlers are putting cameras inside her home. And they always have an eye inside her home. Yes, people live in fear and they didn't take any action because the fear is very, very big inside us. It's like we are surrounded with death and the smell of death every every day. And we don't know if we send our children to bring bread from the, the bakery, they will return back or not. Maybe they will be arrested or killed in the way. Yes, this is what it looks like to live under occupation. It's not easy. Maybe you see or uh, you witness some strong women, such like me, who come and speak <coughs> with you because we have this strong inside us to create a better future for our children. This is what we are trying to do, to create this, this future for our children, because what we are living in, it's not something similar to what you are living. When I come here, I feel that, that everything is a lecture for me, a lecture that I can, I can tomorrow, ride on the train and go from Denmark to Sweden. It's very funny for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because sometimes things are people, things are changing a little bit here, so it's not easy to be a foreigner in Denmark. But that's another. That's, it's not comparable, I would say. Sir, I want to say something about the international law, if you allow. Yes, but you yeah. will come back. I'll give the word to him a little bit okay. now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, I try to, to remember. Uh, first, uh, there is now an international uh, pact between fascists and even Nazis uh, around the globe, and unfortunately, very often, those fascists have uh, good relations with the, Israel, with the Israeli government. Because they, for two main reasons. One, I, I'm ashamed to say that, but that's a fact. They share the same values. This is one thing. Secondly, more often than not, they also share the same interests. And the same interests stem from their uh, will to find a scapegoat for the very class structure. Now I have to talk at least for once as a Marxist. <laughs> uh, that uh, in a class system, you know, the capitalist class system, it's very, very common for the ruling classes and the servants in the government to find a scapegoat, to divert the rage, especially in times of crisis, towards another. That's something that is very common to the Israeli governments, in plural, not only this one. And many fascist factions and parties and movements all over the globe, it's not a coincidence that the best friends of Netanyahu are Milei, Trump, Orban, Modi, uh, Duterte, all the good guys. And, uh, so that's as to your question, I hope I answered, I'm trying to be very, very fast. Uh, that has to do also with, this, with the lobby. Uh, I think that the problem is not a pro-Israeli lobby or a Jewish lobby. I think that's again to divert our attention to the wrong place. The real place is to focus on the ruling classes. The ruling classes are the ones who actually have the power to control policies of governments. It, and it doesn't matter if those ruling classes consist of one ethnic group or another ethnic group, one religion or another religion. The main issue is the class basis of the capitalist society that creates lack 
of a, or a, a unequal, very unequal relations of power. That's the main issue. As to the UNRWA, uh, Israel passed uh, last month, I think it was about a month ago, more or less, uh, two laws about UNRWA. And again, we and the Islamic party in the Knesset, we were the only ones who opposed it. There was a huge majority, including from the opposition. One <laughs> forbids the very activities of UNRWA within the state of Israel. The second is, is forbidden for Israeli agencies, including individuals, to cooperate with UNRWA. That means that UNRWA doesn't exist in practice. And of course, the consequence for the Palestinians is more starvation, is less, even less, education, less humanitarian aid. It is another aspect and layer in the will to subordinate the Palestinian people. That's the main motivation and the gist of those two UNRWA uh, laws. What was the, uh, there was another one? Like, ah, the international law. No, I do not trust the internet. I, I trust, not only agree, eh, not always agree. The problem is not with the law itself. The problem is with the enforcement of the law and the agencies that are supposed to enforce the law. Obviously, I do not trust them. I have no reason to trust them. But what I tried to say before is that without them, the situation will be even worse. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. That is not to say that the existing situation is good. Far from that, as I said before, if the situation was good and the laws were impartially enforced, so we could discuss here football. <laughs> and I wish one day we could. I even have them with me all, like always, the heart of Liverpool. Um, I think I was a little bit surprised on the on the hack, the law, the ICJ, that they were brave enough to come out. I'm also even it took so many years with the ICC. I also am uh, proud of these judges because I know that they will be. They will be terrorized, honestly, and they will be getting lawsuits, and they will be getting threats, and they will be getting American invasion, uh, whatever, blackmail, and all these kind of things. So it's uh, <coughs> so there, are, there are some brave uh, judges still in that system. Um, some years ago, I um, some of our Palestinian friends suggested that the PA should just give up uh, the their ruling because and now when the when you have the Israeli government saying that they will just give over the military rule to civil, they will annex the West Bank, they have cancelled UNRWA. I mean, it's I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of this giving up still, because who will then take care of the Palestinian lives? And we, don't, and we know that Israelis will not at all take care. So it is abandonment, as you said in the beginning of your speech, it's, it's a full abandon, abandonment of the Palestinian. So how can you believe in international law? That was the question. <laughs> Actually, we try to believe in the international law. And we start this trying because uh, our European friend advised us to believe in international law. We feel that all of these UN resolution is not fair enough for us as Palestinians. And we try to go for something looks for me and for most of the socialist, real socialist and communist people who understand the values of this uh, very realistic and more realistic than the UN resolutions and even the two-state solution and the Oslo agreement. But still, we as Palestinians always seeking peace. We are seeking to keep ourselves access in this life, to keep us ongoing. <coughs> so we try to believe in international law. This is your advice. 
as our European friend, and we took it, and we start to talk in the same language that you want us to talk, uh, with the international law, and we use the diplomatic ways. We go for the justice uh, court, and we go for the criminal court, and we run a very fair case. It took very long. <coughs> And then we got some resolution that support us as Palestinian in our demands. And finally, the ICC um, arresting uh, request as well. And we are waiting for you to believe in the international law because we discovered that you give us an advice to, uh, to believe in the international law and you are not really supporting this international law and you are not believing in it. So the question now, it's either that you are not believing in the international law, and it was a big, a very big fake, and we believe it as Palestinian. Um, and then everyone must say that there is no thing, nothing called international law, and we must find um, a new system for everyone, not just for the Palestinian. We are not a special case. We didn't treat ourselves as a special case as well as the Israeli. No, we are not a special case. We are trying to follow what is happening and to be part of this language, the international language, the global uh, system and language. So we are trying to believe in the international law to use these methods and all of these things. The other plan, uh, other like you said, what is the other plan for us? The other plan is to keep uh, resisting and to keep uh, going in our life uh, in our land and trying our best to to get our independency. How I can't tell you how, but if you have like a recipe or uh, <laughs> something magical that can give me this right, I will be very happy. Biden, in his visit to Bethlehem, uh, said to uh, to Abbas, the president Abbas, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, that we need Jesus to come down <laughs> to the earth so he can solve this um, <laughs> this question, this, this case, the Palestinian case, and give you uh, a state because he is just the president of the United States. He is not Jesus. He is not God to solve this problem. So we can wait for Jesus again because we know that Jesus is Palestinian. <laughs> He is the king of the Jewish, he is Palestinian, he suffered and sacrificed himself to serve everybody in this earth. And maybe the solution is to wait for him to come again, I don't know. Okay, let's have some more questions. I remember some hands. How many do you want? Yeah, two, three. Three is a lot. Yes, it's a lot. Uh, who are we taking, Thomas? Yeah, the first ones. Hi, my name is Casper. I would like to ask you, you said that when the, the two teachers came before just, they were released. So could you have some faith in the Israeli judges and the court system? Because uh, I, I hear and I read today that the state attorney uh, demanded that Netanyahu came and gave his uh, evidence on uh, December 2nd, so maybe as Al Capone, he could be brought down on corruption and uh, tax evasion instead of uh, genocide. Would that be a solution? Like Al Capone, you know, you know that Al Capone was arrested eventually for tax. Yeah. <laughs> so, who knows? Yeah, but I'm here for the Yeah, you have jeg hedder Jørgen, og jeg kommer lige inden fra Oh, I speak English, I'm sorry. My name is Jørgen, and I just arrived from Copenhagen Civil Court. And there was a lot of young people protesting against against prisoning prisoning in a rude behavior and stuff like that. Uh, um, and the thing is, I had some. Uh, and the, okay. 
Øh, det jeg var der inde for, det var at se, hvordan de unge mennesker... Det, det er jo andet for... Øh, det var... Sorry. Sorry, I'll get into it. Um, Or Arabic. I was in, I was in there uh, to see how the young people, they were handling the problem uh, with the civil authorities and uh, also to uh, to give some uh, posters uh, because I think uh, to get the uh, Danish government to stop uh, supplying weapons uh, and uh, bombs for uh, for Israel and uh, we have made a we have made a proposal which has to be uh, confirmed by 50,000 um, 50,000 votes, uh, so it will be taken up in the Danish parliament. The and question? The question is, uh, the, the, this was just an information. The question, <laughs> I, for, I forgot to take some of this. Uh, uh, there were so many that were having this uh, pamphlet I was uh, giving out, so I didn't have any to bring here today. So my question is, when we are finished here, if I can stand with my phone here, I have a uh, QR code where you can get uh, access to the proposal, so you can go in if you feel for it, which I hope, uh, to, uh, to support the... Good, thanks. To, to it's support. not a question, but we'll take it out in the end. It's, okay. uh, it's a and suggestion then one more to, thing support, to the... support the Borger Flores I guess, right? Okay, and is it fair to say, uh, I, I can't pronounce your name? Of, 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 okay, of. is it fair to say, uh, when you told us about uh, what happened uh, uh, during the Second uh, World War with the Danes and uh, uh, helping the Jews come to Sweden, uh, I, I have some parallels, but I want your opinion if it's fair to say that uh, uh, Zionism is uh, equal to Nazism. Good, that's a that? question. But then we'll take a few more. Okay. One more. One more, yeah? Yes. Okay. There was one raised hand. Um, thank you. I have a slightly different type of question. Um, I do think that there is a pressure on Netanyahu right now because of that verdict. Because that is an enormous uh, loss of prestige. A lot of people didn't think it would happen. Whether he's going to be really captured or not, of course we will doubt that. But it is a pressure on him. Anyway, the question is, today uh, the Israel, uh, Netanyahu has announced that he recommends his cabinet to endorse the uh, ceasefire with Hezbollah. And um, so the question I have for you, do you think that this is for real? Uh, the first comments were that this was a victory for Israel because they would only engage in that ceasefire because they have won over Hezbollah. And we know a lot of the leaders have been killed. Uh, and in that vein, what do you think about the ongoing uh, negotiations about a ceasefire in Gaza, and what do you think about the role of the of, of Qatar and the other Arab, Arabic states? Do you think they have a positive role to play, or will they do that, or will be will do that in the future? Okay, that was quite quite three different kinds of questions, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, so it was Israeli judiciary and it was uh, Zionism, Nazism, and ceasefire. You can uh, I give the first word to you and you can answer what okay. you like. Okay. So first of all, the answer is no. I have no confidence in the judicial system in Israel, I, like I have no confidence in most of the institu institutions in Israel, vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. As far as the Palestinians are concerned in general, and especially Palestinians, in the 1967 occupied territories, no institution in Israel ever showed any reason to trust or have confidence in it, including the judicial system. The ju judicial system is part, is a great part of the occupation and the oppression of the Palestinians since day one. So in that respect, I do and, and by the way, by, by uh, uh, every day it's less. The, the judicial system has normally proved <coughs> to be quite fair, but the question is vis-a-vis -vis who? Mm. 
And if it was the Palestinians, they always disappointed them. I do not remember one case of the thousands and thousands and thousands of so-called administrative detention, which is, less poetically, a case of kidnap. No other word to describe it. <clears throat> not even once the Supreme Court or any other part of the judicial system <coughs> who ordered to release Palestinians who were uh, in so-called administrative detention, although we are dealing here with kidnap and imprisoning someone with no trial, no evidence, no nothing, and, sometimes, and, vo and often uh, without even the ability to uh, meet a lawyer for a long time. And the uh, same about demolition of Palestinian houses, destruction of neighborhoods, uh, orders of the, uh, and rulings by the occupation forces uh, that allows even killing people. 90% of the time, the judicial system has done nothing in order to defend and protect the Palestinians. Now, within Israel, it's a different case. It's a, let's say that there are more cases that we can trust the judicial system, but in the bottom line, obviously I cannot say across the board that I do. It's much closer to say that I don't, but yet, like I said before in regard to the international law, without the judicial system, or without the independence of the judicial system, which is exactly what now the government tries to abolish, it's going to be even more uh, uh, mean, and it's going to be even worse. So that's the answer as to the first question. Uh, the second question, Zionism and Nazism, no, there's no comparison. I do think, I'm anti-Zionist. I think Zionism is uh, racist, and it is uh, uh, anti-humane uh, in its practices, and it's, uh, in, in its uh, ideological gist, but I cannot say that because of that, it, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, it's like Nazism. There are many forms of racism, not all of them are Nazism. So I wouldn't say those are the same. There was that one question more. Uh, ceasefire. Ah. But uh, she uh, You want me to? to? Uh, only if you have okay. a short one. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that if the ceasefire is really achieved, and the last time I read the news, it was not signed yet. But if it is achieved, it will be for two main reasons. One, in order to evacuate Israeli forces from the north to kill more Palestinians in Gaza. And secondly, because of some pressure from a, a Biden. Some pressure. Of course, too little, too late, but some. So if it is signed, on the one hand, of course, uh, I support the ceasefire because I don't want to see more bloodshed, more destruction, neither in Lebanon nor in, uh, is in, in, is in Israel. But, I, but the most important thing at the same time is to insist on total ending of the genocide in Gaza. By the way, very important to release the Israeli hostages as well. This is also a humane requirement, and the genocide must be put to an end immediately. Hostages should be released. Uh, uh, hostages on both sides. Uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners should be released. And, uh, and of course, free Palestine. That's the only thing that should be achieved immediately in order to prevent more bloodshed, more suffering. That's what should be done as soon as possible. I will qualify. <laughs> I will also say end apartheid, and I think it's important. All of you should know the the three reports. Uh, I work in a human rights organization, but the three reports by Betzelem, by Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty from two, three, four years ago, they are important. Uh, on apartheid, yeah. one of them called From the River to the Sea. I think it's uh, Bet Salem's report has this title. A Regime of Jewish Supremacy. Yes, and it's a very good report, so I can recommend it to all of you. Um, yes, good ceasefire. I will add, uh, maybe they, uh, they have like... Uh, 
a deal with the United States to return back um, the weapons. Um, yeah, yeah. Because they, they put some limitation in importing uh, weapons to Israel, and it's like they make a deal if they make a ceasefire in Lebanon, they will allow them to go to influence to more and more American weapons as Israeli, and they need these weapons nowadays to continue the genocide in Gaza and other Sorry. things. And there's a lot of tricks in these ceasefires, as I read. One of it, one of these tricks for there's four main tricks, but one of these that it allowed uh, for Israel to attack Lebanon and to enter the Lebanese lands whenever they feel that there is a risk on their security. And we know what, what the meaning of feeling uh, in a risk for the security reasons for Israel. It means that they always live in these fears and they always have these suspicions. So they can maybe end these, uh, these deal in a few days after they got the American weapons uh, again, and this is remind me in one thing about uh, militarizations, and we fight as a Mediterranean and European for a very long uh, time against militarization all over the world, mm -hmm. and we have we stand together in one uh, lane uh, against militarization. But when it comes to Israel, we have some suspicions that maybe we can allow some weapons to be uh, yeah, sent to Israel because it's a special case. So it's not about our values as leftists. It's not about what we fight for more than 10 years about it. And we are talking about ecological life and uh, the global warming and all of these things. But it, when it comes for the agricultural lands in, in the West Bank and when it comes for the ecocide that Israel is doing in Gaza Strip, we have some suspicions if it's met our goals and values or not as leftists. So please be honest with yourself and stop being misled by this information uh, and fears that, that Israel and uh, the United States is putting you under this uh, misinformation and misled information in taking your decision and decide if you are leftist or not, if you believe in these values of human, human rights or not, if you are against militarization or not. Take a decision and be honest with this decision with the Palestinian as well as the Ukrainian and the European and whatever. Stop thinking as the white super, super, um, superism, yes, and that you have right as white people and when it becomes for the colored people like us, we have some suspicions if the same values uh, will uh, be adopted or not. So that's my point. Maybe there's not too many questions left, I think. Yeah, you have a last one? I would like to know what's going to happen to the Kassanians uh, yeah. down on the beach, the one million people on the beach. Gaza? What's the future? Mm. <laughs> I wish we knew. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Speak. I, <laughs> the, the question was what will happen to the people living in Gaza on the beach? The refugees, the one and some million. Yes. Jesus coming. Jesus and Palestine. First of all, I, we must raise uh, a prayer all together even we are not very uh, religious, uh, that this winter will go without snow and without heavy rains in Palestine. But it's started in different way because now it's like, I think, four degrees. And the, the rains didn't stop th since three days. And uh, you are talking about not one million, it's about two million mm -hmm. people who have no roof, or place or shelter uh, to be um, warm in it or at least hide from these heavy rains uh, in it. 
feeling fair and secure and hungry. So maybe if you try to stand outside without a jacket, without a clothes, for 10 minutes and you, after that you start to think about those people who are starving and feeling affairs under this weather, what it will be the condition of them. Um, those, those people are killed by Israel and sacrificed and neglected by the world. Yes. That's what's going on. Mm -hmm. ah, to repeat? Yes. I said that those people, those two million Palestinians, are killed by Israel and neglected and sacrificed by the entire world. And history will never forget that. Thank you. I would actually like to end by quoting Naomi Klein, who said, what, what is it that uh, Netanyahu has in common with the uh, Western leaders these days, like Mette Frederiksen? And what they have in common is that they want to build walls and have camps and keep the other people outside. And they want to use a lot of weapon to shoot them when they want to share of the wealth within the bubble of the white people who are using all the keeping, destroying the planet in its overuse of resources. And uh, that, was a, that was an uh, epiphany sort of for me, or it was a realization, okay, that is what they have in common. Camps, walls, weapons. And that's uh, what we need to fight. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. And thank you for